get our week started with our, our kickstart, our reflection, our introspection, some perspective to the weekend. This week, of course, it begins an important time in the Jewish calendar, having just concluded Pesach. And on Wednesday, Thursday, we go to Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Memorial Day. A few days after that, we have Yom HaZikaron, Israel's Memorial Day, and then Yom HaTzma'ut, Israel's Independence Day. So a lot of things that are blended together coming out of, you know, the experience of springtime of the liberation of uh, slavery and the story of the Exodus to our modern story of slavery and the redemption with the state of Israel. And I thought what an appropriate time to invite a good friend of mine, Dr. Guy Stern, to come and share a little bit and to talk with us. And Dr. Stern is the director of the Harry and Wanda Zeckelman International Institute of the Righteous and distinguished professor emeritus at Wayne State University, um, and is also a proud member of Temple Shir Shalom. And one of my greatest honors is when Dr. Stern calls, refers to me as rabbi, calls me as rabbi and asks me to help him in the rabbinic capacity, whether it's saying, hey, can I, can I hang my hat at Temple and do some of my writing there and uh, use a desk in the office there, as he did when he when he drafted his autobiography that was published and finally came out last May. And we're excited that uh, he is going to be honored very, very soon on 60 Minutes for the story about the Ritchie boys, which will be coming out in May and uh, was filmed already. And we're looking forward to that interview. Supposedly in the 60 Minutes interview, they spent you know over six hours together, two to three hours of interview time with Dr. Stern to condense it to 15 minutes. All we need here, 15 minutes, because we know how articulate he is, and you know our conversations will be right spot on, no editing necessary. Welcome, Dr. Stern. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, what I can contribute uh, this morning to uh, your and Rabbi Schwartz's uh, explication of of uh, of the Exodus, uh, I uh, took out of the New Yorker this this week. And there is a cartoon in there of, uh, of the Exodus as you and the and your colleague never taught it, and it is the as you know with their cartoons. So uh, <laughs> you'll be enlightened how the New Yorker sees Exodus. <laughs> um, <laughs> I can only imagine. Of course, I've learned some of my best wisdom from the New Yorker as well. Um, Couple of thoughts, questions for you. I, I love how you ended your autobiography with what occurred, um, I think it was October 2018, two and a half years ago, when you were honored at the University of Michigan's homecoming game. I was actually driving in my car, hearing it being announced that you were called to center field at the game. Um, and uh, you reflected on that and why it meant so much as you stood there in the field and 115,000 roaring fans uh, celebrated you as veteran of the game. Uh, why? Why does that mean so much to you? Why was that such a special time? Because you, your stories are remarkable, and you've experienced so much in your 99 years already, and continue to. Why that moment so important? Yes, because uh, when you look at the people who who watch a football game at the University of Michigan one of the big, big stadiums in our country, uh, you find people of all walks of life and all sorts of allegiances. And here it is a symbol of our whole uh, population. And uh, here we are united as we should be soon again uh, in, our, in our country. And so I was so thrilled that I was getting what you might call a homage from a whole cross cut of our American, uh, of our Americans fellow citizens. And this meant a lot to me because I have been obviously in the, my, uh, being made an American citizen, I belong by rights now, as everybody else does, whether an immigrant or a Native American, we belong, sure. But this was a way of showing 
me as an as an immigrant, I am part and parcel of this crowd. And that is, it was very important to me uh, as we stood there uh, on the 30 yard line, not, not, <laughs> oh, not, not center, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, uh, in, and uh, so, it was very important. It, it also was important that our opponent that day was the University of Maryland, where I was not very happy as a faculty member. <laughs> nice. So you had the, and Michigan won that game too. So yeah. that was the other positive of that too. We're, I'm referring to, of course, Dr. Stern's autobiography. Like I said, it came out finally in May last year called Invisible Inc. And uh, I can't recommend this enough that recounts his life from Germany um, all the way really to today and, and how important that is. Um, what's gotten you a lot of coverage in a sense, a lot of news stories is um, you being part of the Ritchie Boys, which were a group of spies uh, who were trained specifically at Camp Ritchie in Maryland um, to then go overseas towards the end of World War II because of um, your you know, skill in many languages, having immigrated from Europe and um, your awareness of European culture as opposed to you know, a, a typical American. So you're our James Bond in a sense. Um, and uh, so how many languages uh, can you converse in? I, well, uh, I, I, I can hold my own, I guess, in uh, English and German uh, and do reasonably well in French and Spanish, which was my undergraduate major under the title of Romance Languages. So, uh, yes, I can make myself understood and understand most of what they're saying, especially if it's complimentary. And uh, I, I, these are uh, what has faded. I also took a course in Dutch, and that is fading rapidly. And uh, I can't, I can't change that. I'd have to take a refresher course at my old age. <laughs> um, humbled I am in hearing that, and also uh, I'm some Russian and Yiddish too, right? I mean, you've. Uh... Because uh, I, I know some of the stories from your time in the Ritchie Boys. And I will say a, a quick personal story. When, oh God, it must have been 15 years ago when the, um, there was an exhibit at the Holocaust Memorial Center about the Ritchie Boys. And you took my three children on a private tour of that and explained to them in terms that were appropriate for an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old, that um, that made sense about the Holocaust and made sense about your work there too. And it was really, they, they still remember that very fondly and importantly in their um, awareness of our world. So um, one of the stories, and I don't know if it's the most dramatic moment for you, but I'm curious is of you playing the role of a Russian general, but is there, is, is I wanted to see what was the most exciting dramatic moment for you in that role as a spy in what you were doing overseas in Europe? Yes, uh, <clears throat> a bulk of our work as, as, a, as, an, as an intelligence team was extracting vital information from German prisoners of war. And we were taught certain techniques of getting them to talk and they ranged from uh, being simply find a common interest to uh, bribing them with cigarettes or food if they had not gotten their supplies. And, but in addition, we at one point found out that we needed yet uh, another way of squeezing information out of the prisoners. And that was very difficult because we got many inquiries from our Air Force. Our Air Force wanted to know, just to give you an example, hey, we heard that uh, the 
<clears throat> optic factory in, say, Dresden, switched uh, uh, their uh, location. Where are they now? What are the landmarks? Uh, how many uh, employees do they have now? And that is so palpable that even the uh, most naive prisoner would see we wanted to know in order to bomb that facility, helping their war effort as, uh, and hit it heavily. So they were very reluctant to speak out because security was one thing, personal interest. Sometimes they had worked there themselves and in one sensational moment, uh, one prisoner revealed that that factory belonged to his father. So he had added reasons to shut up. So how do you, how do you compel him uh, by pressure or fear to answer our questions? And that's where I invented together with a pal of mine, uh, Fred Howard, who uh, was in charge of the target interrogations. With him, we worked out the Commissar Krukov approach, which was that uh, I dressed up as a Russian with the Russian uniform parts we had taken from liberated Russian uh, prisoners of the Germans uh, and uh, with medals all over me, which we had taken from uh, souvenir hunting German prisoners. And here was born Commissar Krukov. So I put a Russian uh, accent in my interrogation, had a sign put up on my tent, Commissar Krukov, liaison officer. And so uh, the worst fear they had was taken prisoners of the Russians. So we, uh, Fred, when he failed, as he mostly did at first, because their reluctance to reveal anything on these factories or on any uh, important targets. What I added to it was that element of fear by saying uh, anybody, uh, we had orders that from the, or agreement from the Americans <clears throat> that prisoners who did not want to cooperate with the American uh, questioner my friend Fred, uh, would be turned over to the Russian liaison officer, Commissar Krukov, and uh, yes, uh, and would be, as it would be delivered to a Russian prisoner camp. So this put the fear of the Lord and of Commissar Krukov in, <laughs> in their minds, and that was an innovation. Now, that demanded also another innovation, uh, and that was mass interrogation, which we were told in our training camp, Camp Ritchie, Maryland, never to use because prisoners would reinforce their security uh, uh, awareness. And so we put in uh, the added element of mass interrogation and that turned out to be very important towards the end of the war because for this I found in no history book uh, the uh, our high brass was afraid the German Germans as in World War I could launch a gas warfare. So I had to get statistical information whether the Germans were prepared for that. And I used the appropriate questions 
How many of you have a gas mask, uh, clothing, protective clothing and the like, and use that. And as I could put their minds at rest, they were ill-equipped for gas warfare because their troops weren't fixed for it. What was um, the most difficult moment for you in returning to Europe and uh, in, in that role as an intelligence officer, whether it was what you saw or what you experienced? Yes, I, I guess I, I would say it came right the days after the armistice was signed because then I had my private mission. Uh, I returned with a buddy to my former hometown in order to make inquiries about the fate of my family. And the news was devastating. Somebody uh, who was in the know and had been loyal to Jewish friends, a family gave me the crushing information that I was the only one in our narrow circle of family. I had a brother and a sister as well, and my grandmother, that they all perished in one of the camps. Yeah, unfathomable, of course. Which also for me, in knowing your work and knowing your focus on altruism in particular, I find so remarkable. Um, you've lectured countless times on altruism, literally traveled the globe speaking about this, presented at Temple Shir Shalom. The two of us have had the privilege to lecture together about that on you know, different views of that. Why has altruism been so much of your focus? Yes, because when I first returned to my hometown and of course depressed by the news I received, uh, I took an internal vow then broken, uh, never to return at any length of time to Germany because the Germans had done this. But you don't, I, I, as I grew older, I realized that mass judgment is frequently false. So there were if far too few people among the Germans who had tried to help and some had spectacularly helped the persecuted Jews, other minorities, uh, other people designated by the Nazis as unworthy to live. And so I liked to, I liked to explore what these people accomplished and what motivated them at the peril of their life and possibly even of their relatives' lives to what motivated them to become altruists. Well, we need more altruism in our world, no doubt, but there is definitely that hope that exists and that we do see within humanity and why we do what we do. Um, speaking of hope, I wanna, as we wrap our time up together, I wanna end with something you shared at the end of your book. Um, you said, uh, to put my thankfulness in one sentence, I became an American patriot. I hope in the best and most positive sense of the word. And looking back on this enthusiasm for the country of my asylum, I conclude that this attitude wasn't free of criticism of my country, the United States as not having fulfilled some of its promises and potentials. And then you ask, can I sustain this attitude for the rest of my life? And so, and you reflect on, you know, some of the challenges that I, I you know, I imagine as you were concluding writing your book in 2019, that we were beginning to see even more of that we've seen since. So um, can you continue that? That yeah, hope in this country? Right. It still represents me fully. Uh, when we were in the service, at all proper opportunities, we took a vow of allegiance. 
And in that vow of allegiance, it says one, na one nation indivisible. And that ideal, which we came to, came very close to, sometimes threatened in our past history, but never so in danger as now that I can say we are one nation indivisible. We have not re-achieved that. And <clears throat> so my attitude is we must. Well, the house divided against itself cannot stand. Yes. Uh, well, this is what we keep working towards, God willing, right? And I will say, um, your understanding, your awareness of our world, of, of politics, of literature, of history is breathtaking. Dr. Stern studies Torah with us every uh, Shabbat morning, and but is always able to reflect and bring Shakespeare into our conversation or, or bring other historical insights into it. And um, um, I'm often in awe of that as well and uh, humbled that we get to study together and learn together. And I greatly appreciate your time this morning. And so uh, we've been together for over 20 minutes. Like I said, it always flies by. Um, we will have a privilege of seeing Dr. Stern on 60 Minutes. We'll, you know, publicize that from Temple uh, on our Facebook and 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 throughout our announcements when we know the exact Sunday in May that it will be broadcast. But we look forward to learning more and hearing how that interview goes and seeing some scenes of you being interviewed at the Holocaust Center and at Temple Shir Shalom for part of that time as well. Dr. Stern, uh, I can't thank you enough for your time this morning and. Um, for your life's work and your contribution to, you know, uh, to our understanding of our world and to the, to the history of it and your experiences means so much to us. And I love that you're continuing to teach and share so eloquently. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I ought to add when you quoted flatteringly from my autobiography and you say, I, uh, Rabbi Schwartz found that uh, that passage, I, it's, uh, or you found it in your yeah. reading. I did, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I want to thank you and add one footnote. Uh, that book you showed uh, probably will appear in German. It will appear in German translated by my wife and uh, and uh, we hope for a uh, enjoyable reading of everybody who acquires it that's uh, thank you Susanna for doing that and you know what um, can't recommend this enough like I said it's available uh, on all of our bookstores on Amazon as well and um, I thank Susanna for helping set today up technologically behind the scenes and to Brian Fishman, who is uh, orchestrating things from Temple for us too. Um, and uh, for all of you for tuning in and being a part of our Monday morning musings. Hey, everyone have a good week. Stay safe. Take care of yourselves. Thank you, Dr. Stern. Thank, Thank you, you. And good luck to all of us at Shift Shalom. Thanks.